So we have now somebody from Philippines, Mr. Ram Sitodas, President Filipino Indian Chamber of Commerce, Philippines, from Manila, to address us. Uh, I'm, I'm sure he's going to keep it brief, and uh, then we're going to have a very enlightening panel discussion. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would just like you gentlemen and ladies to know passport doesn't make you an Indian. It's the patriotism within you and the love for your country which makes you Indian. So if you hold a foreign passport or any kind of passport, these are just travel documents. So the love for you, for your country, India, should be born. Philippines is a country with 7,107 islands. And it is a population of 80 million people. Philippines and India have long-time relations. As a matter of fact, that the olden coins of India you can find in the Philippines in the 1800s. The two countries have been trading partners with each other since the beginning of the Christian era. The Indian population set in the Philippines is estimated to be around 40,000. They consist of Punjabis and Sindhis. A number of them are businessmen. There are also a number of Indian professionals today who work in the Philippines. The Indian community in the Philippines has quite a few social and business charitable organizations, such as Bombay Merchants, Seva Foundation, Indian Ladies Club, etc. The Indian Chamber of Commerce has recently completed 55 years of its existence and has helped promotion of trade and business relations between the two countries. The Philippines and India established formal diplomatic relations. Sorry. Formal diplomatic relations in 1949. As of today, the bilateral trade between India and Philippines has reached about 750 million US dollars. The items of export to the Philippines include buffalo meat, pharmaceuticals, iron and steel manufacturing, textile yarn, petrochemicals, organic chemicals, etc. Things exported from the Philippines to India include the semiconductor, inorganic chemicals, or the parts. Major Indian investment, like my gentleman who said right now, Aditya Birla, they had put up a textile industry out there spinning in 1979. They are one of the biggest. As a matter of fact, they just came in again last week with an IT company called Spransper, where they will employ about 500 people. We also have the Hindujas who have put up a 2,800 call center in the Philippines. And we have many more BPOs coming in there. As a matter of fact, we had gone to delegation to India last uh, September, where we visited Mumbai, Delhi, Bangalore, and Hyderabad. As a matter of fact, right now, we were discussing, yesterday we were discussing with some people from Ahmedabad where they said that the animation is pretty good in, in Gujarat. But I would say that the people of animation in Hyderabad and Bangalore are from the Philippines. So I would request, gentlemen, that today Philippines is the right market for you, gentlemen, to come in and invest in IT because we have the infrastructure and we also have the human power, which is there, the manpower. Now, discussing about myself, of course, Mr. George Abraham had told me to write a story about myself. I would just say that it's just a humble beginning. I was born in the Philippines. When I was the age of four, my dad expired. We went back to Pune, India, where my mother would sew some clothes and bring us up. I came back to the Philippines in 1970, where we started. The, I was studying and working at the same time. In about 1973, I went into trading business and in 1979 I went to garment manufacturing where we export most of our garments in the United States. And I would say that a lot of Indians in the Philippines right now. 
if I have to talk about Philippines, I will keep on going and going and going. I would just say to cut it short, I better give more time to question and answers. Thank you very much. Mr. Ram, thank you. Uh, you really were brief. Uh, maybe I get the impression that immediately following this would be the panel discussion. But then, before embarking on a 22-hour flight, I thought I would keep it a little distant. So now we have a 22-hour flight to United States of America. And we have Mr. Adil Ali, founder and president of the World Link Incorporation from Dallas. All the way from Dallas comes Mr. Adil Ali. Americans are known for keeping it brief. <laughs> okay, not too brief, not too brief, but it's so, no, not brief. Thank you very much, uh, Ganesh, uh, all our friends gathered here. This is not going to be brief because I have with me the biggest and the greatest presentation. So please, uh, lights can be turned the lights down and we have a big... Uh, Music and extravaganza going on. So can we have the lights now? <laughs> There's no lights? Okay, I just created a dream. I just became a dream merchant. As my friend uh, Mr. Ram Punjabi told, America would be the place where you would come and make your dreams realize and make your dreams come true. Not all Americans are you know, arrogant. Not all Americans are bad. Not Americans are... America is a melting point where Asians, like myself, have gone there 20 years ago and made it our home. So I feel very proud and I feel very patriotic to be an American number one. And uh, the color of my passport has changed. But it's still blue. The color is still blue. So I don't see any change in color. And it's all upon how you really become a melting point, how you really, really come and embrace the society. Here we are not here to talk about America, other countries. Here I'm going to talk about very briefly about entrepreneurship, Thai. Thai stands for the Indus Entrepreneur, is one of the founders of the Thai Dallas chapter. I do not wear a tie because that kind of restricts my freedom of entrepreneurship. Oh. My counterpart is uh, sitting, Mr. Indijit Singh, he's the president of Thai Singapore. I've been the president of Thai Dallas. You know, everywhere we hear the talk, similar talk is uh, invest in certain countries, invest in Indonesia, invest in Jakarta, invest in Mauritius, everywhere invest in Malaysia. One quick thought, I mean, I'm not prepared anything, by the way, so the dream thing was not true, you know. <laughs> so the uh, one point is invest in yourself, invest in the land where you are right now, invest in the people with you are right now. Invest in Singapore, invest in Malaysia, within Malaysia, within Singapore, <coughs> what US is, is the grand marketplace. Sell your products there. You have the talent. Indonesia has the biggest <coughs> amount of talent in terms of numbers. Philippines has a great call center, has great intelligence. India has great mathematicians, great scientists, other things. So what we really have to do is to create that product within our own country and come over to US to see if we can sell that market, we can sell that product. That is the biggest message I think uh, you know, we have. And uh, you know, if you need anything further, my email address is there. I'm not going to make it really, really short because then uh, we have some time for question answers. I would really like you all to answer. Uh, question me some very important. Please, no political questions, OK? But don't ask me anything about Bush, <coughs> but I'm not going to say. I'm from Texas. My uh, Dallas Cowboys team, I'm a football fan also. So Dallas Cowboys is playing right now as we, uh, can somebody tell me what's the score with uh, Carolina Panthers. <laughs> so, but I also enjoy cricket. I've got the tickets for the World Cup and that's, that's the importance. That's the real importance of Americans, Indian Americans going and making that land really rich with having their culture with having the beauty, you know, we still see Indian movies there, we still love cricket, you know, all of our, all our customers are going to go very close by to Jamaica and watch uh, the World Cup. So, in, in short, look at it as an opportunity, look at it as a truly big, big, big brother, okay? Do not uh, think that, you know, bad American arrogant, okay? That's only the message that we have. And, uh, and it's all upon yourself. 
the, the place where you can make a corporation within 24 hours. Legally, you can incorporate it within 24 hours. You can hire, you know, immigration becomes an issue. We cannot get more people from all over the world very quickly. But that also, we can do it. But the most important thing is ingenious products. You know, India has got the largest manpower capital in India, China. We talk about India and China. I want to be empowering our Indian folks is where is the products coming out? Where are the products? Do we name any single product coming out? Yes, Infosys has a banking product, which one of my colleagues was telling me, that uh, it's a product which will sell 10, 20 million dollars. We had a conversation outside, you know. Where is the Microsoft of the world? Yes, we do have Infosys, Wipro, Satyam. These are all services companies. But where are the products which will change the lifestyle, which will change and move you? That is coming from US. All Indians in US are the most successful. They run large 200, 300 million dollar groups, <coughs> billions of dollars. I don't have any statistics for how big US markets are, but you know, 300 million people, an average income of more than 25, 30 thousand dollars per year. And they are all spending and consumer. The internet has come out from US. The largest wireless initiative has come out from US. So a lot of things is coming out. So India can be a breeding ground of that product. And once the products are formed, you know, look at America. Look at America being a launching. And we have a lot of avenues to get there. Ties, one <coughs> avenue, uh, other institutions are there to come and welcome you to see. I'm not telling you to come to US and all that stuff, OK? Invest in where you are. Invest in India. Invest in your land. Invest in the Philippines. Invest in in uh, Indonesia. And then, if you make a very good film, which is in a great US market, that should be the message in this whole podium right now. And that would be the very important message that we can take back home. That, uh, you know, India, China, other countries produce products, and then we sell it to the US. I think that's as brief as I can be. Thank you very much. And it's been a pleasure. This is refreshing, but Americans have to do everything differently. They switch on, they switch on the wrong side. Anyway, this was a wonderful thing. I thank all the speakers, and may I now request all of you, the speakers, to please come on the podium, so that I mean on the dais, so that we can have a panel discussion. And may I request uh, Mr. Arun Maharzanan, sorry. That Z, Z sounds like an R. I'm sorry for that. Uh, I did practice it a little before coming here, but I don't know what has happened. Uh, he will be moderating this panel discussion. Now, the panel discussion could be between themselves and with also uh, contributions from you all. Uh, I'll leave it to Mr. Arun to decide. He's the chairman of and director of the Institute of Policy Studies in Singapore. So at least we have a policy maker here. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this hour is yours. But this hour is only going to be for half an hour. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dinesh, can you hear me? Yes. Is it on? Okay. Um, since we have an extension of the time from 12.30 uh, to 12.30, let me first of all uh, uh, open the discussion to the floor uh, without uh, who would like to start off? No one has a question. I thought this was an up day of the summit. Please. I think my voice is quite loud, so I don't need to go to the mic. Uh, are you recording this joke? Yes. Ah. Yeah. Uh, Rama, way, would you mind just stepping up with the recording? <coughs> Yeah, this is uh, just uh, the three points I would like to make here. What is the word diaspora? I have a problem with the word. Uh, you know, every day you say that's fine. Is it on? Yeah. It's on. But then uh, the diaspora provides a meaning as though that the Indian communities uh, outside India are mere extensions of India. 
speech to me may not be very accurate because in Malaysia they have hundred over years of history. Singapore, I can say, probably longer in South Africa. Are we there the extensions of India? The Indian communities in these countries have been transformed. The very uh, concept of transformation actually tells us that we have also mixed with other races. Uh, and so I think the meaning that if we are mere extensions of India, if this is the meaning of the concept of diaspora, then I think maybe we have to look into it. It's not wrong. I think we need to refine it. The second question uh, which I think was very interesting, coming from uh, Sony Navaratna, which I thought I was uh, interesting. And one of the visions was to create the possibility of ending wars in Africa and uh, South Asia. Uh, my question to you, Sony, is how? And the third one is on Malaysia. My friend, uh, what's his name? Uh, Siva. Siva. He had a very interesting presentation. But I'd like to just to provide some correction that the Indian equity has declined from 1.5% in the year 2000 to Malaysia to 1.2%. So I think if you look at the just the equity question, uh, that we have actually fallen. Thank you. Okay. Um, would, you, would you like to, who would like to take the last part of this? I think uh, maybe one of you can take that, then we'll ask uh, Sunny to talk about it. Well, I don't think we we are bound to limit ourselves to one definition of diaspora. I don't think, I mean, for example, in Mauritius, my, my forefathers came to India, from India, five generations ago. Well, I, I don't speak the language, uh, but still, uh, obviously, uh, my ancestors come from India. As I think we, uh, belonging to the Indian that's diaspora, can, 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 can be construed to mean directly or indirectly we belong to the family of people who at one point in time since the creation of the world you know we can trace them back to India and in, in that way they, they share uh, uh, an affinity together uh, in the way they, they behave in the way they live or in the way they look like you know, no, 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 none of us look like Swedish or Norwegians. So, uh, just, just, just because we, 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 we look alike, that would be sufficient to call us all belonging to Indian diaspora. But, but, but to answer your question, I don't think we should limit ourselves to a strict definition. Uh, that would be my contribution. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, Yes, an interesting uh, question, and I probably won't, uh, this won't be the appropriate forum to give a full answer to it. But the way we work is actually through educating leaders. Um, if you look at the causes of war around the world, uh, they are very much the same as the causes of conflict that you have in your day to day life uh, with, with husbands and wives and children and parents and stuff. If you look at the underlying reason of why those conflicts take place, you'll also find the same things happening in a global or larger sense. Uh, the work we do is about training and educating leaders. So when we work with Azalias Rubewa, for example, who was the leader of the uh, Eastern Congo government, as they were called, the rebel force, uh, he, four hours of conversation with him, to give you quickly, he'll tell you, when we sit down and do some work with uh, these guys, they come in to the conversations that we have with them as, as generals, as, as presidents, as rebels, as uh, colonels, as soldiers. When we finish a dialogue or a conversation with them, they come out as husbands, brothers, sons, children, parents. So they leave aside the stories they have in their heads about the conflicts and what their position in those conflicts are and become human beings. That's kind of what we do. We go out and try to bring humanity back to human beings. That's the way we call the stop war. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And uh, Dr. Singh, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Professor Alba. Uh 1.2%, 1.5%. I think uh, in terms of actual spread, I think that figure is irrelevant. Whatever it is, I agree, it's 1.2%. 
Now, what's more important, I believe, uh, in the Indian scenario is, is the flow of the total capitalization of equity in Malaysia. Now, if you take uh, the Indian equity, the group of companies by Anand Krishnan, Anglo PLC, Maxis, and then we have Air Asia, uh, which is owned by Dr. Fernandez and his friends. We have MPLN, owned by Dr. Kasi and his uh, Malay equity partner. And there were a few other public sector companies, which I believe is held by a minority few Indians, can run up to almost 60 to 70 percent of the total equity. So, at the end of the day, the rest of the Indians are holding a very minor portion, but the majority of the stake of the equity is held by a few Indians. I suppose the situation is somewhat similar in other Asian countries too. Thank you. Okay, uh, I think some of the questions have gotten off sight of the jacket in my view because the, the main purpose is how to enhance business opportunities among the Indian diaspora. So I welcome questions that uh, you know address those fundamental issues. Anyone else? Okay, while you're thinking, uh, let me invoke uh, the privilege of the chair and then uh, I have a couple of questions or at least comments that I think uh, are bothering me. Uh, how many of you are Singaporeans here? How many of you are Singaporeans? Okay, uh, not even half. One thing that I noticed from the presentations is something that is extremely valuable for Singaporeans in particular, which is we always ask, what can the government do for us? Here are a number of examples where Indians have either gone abroad, uh, in one case at least, or they have been born abroad and taken an extremely a small minority uh, community's resource to make a very, very good business. And uh, I, to me, this seems a, a, a valuable lesson for Singaporeans. What is the role of the government in some of these other countries and you know are there any for instance in Malaysia there is a general complaint that even when Indians want to do business there is a licensing system that doesn't allow people to be even small entrepreneurs. What is the experience I mean uh, Mr. Ram you basically created your own business and uh, and I see that happen even in Australia you know uh, what is the lesson that you would share with us you know, in terms of doing it yourself and not depending on the government. Kevin, if you don't mind. The unique aspect of doing business in Malaysia is how do you manage the politics of managing business? That's what it is all about. The politics. Now we have these three major ethnic groups and the others. And the issue about who gets what is always raised. In the last 10 15 years, the business has been run under a patronage scheme. I often refer to it as the three C's. The three C's I refer to is business is managed and controlled by the crooks, the clowns, and the cronies, unfortunately. Most of the developing nations, we have this problem. Politics it is a power to get, uh, to penetrate into the field of business. Now, when are they going to leave business completely out of politics? that it can be run on a level playing field the best and the fittest will survive. I thought the scenario would change under the new regime, but I think it's been still been uh, continued, unfortunately. Let's talk about new economic policy which has been a major hurdle, which has eroded Malaysia from the international map in terms of efficiency, competitiveness. The government can come up with a whole lot of uh, budget incentives to make it pro business. But when it comes to the implementation, the bureaucrats sit in their ivory tower and see how they can help the, the Malay community. Now, when they decide to leave business alone to be run on its own, only then we see the light at the end of the tunnel. There is too many government regulatory framework in terms of uh, uh, a presence the equity to be owned by the indigenous community licenses, uh, approvals, permits, and what have you. In fact, uh, we have been moving into very added uh, uh, higher echelon of the business uh, sector, uh, biotech, and even that 
uh, consideration in terms of uh, allocation in terms of racial is coming in. Uh, uh, but no Siva, my, my, my question is really precisely that, you know, in other countries there is no such thing as level playing field. And I'd like to hear how the others manage, you know, where they don't even have ethnic parties that represent uh, Indians. So how do you do it in Qatar, how do you do it in Indonesia, and how do you do it in Australia? Well, in Indonesia, there are certain businesses which are still closed for foreigners. <coughs> and one of the businesses is the media business. Okay, but media business directly cannot be owned by foreigners, but through holding companies with this government, it is being allowed. So any anything which goes public through holding companies can be uh, owned by the foreigners. Okay, but still the Indonesian government and the law says the majority of this business remains with the uh, with the locals, <clears throat> because the understanding between that thought is that uh, educating the local people has to be with uh, the Indonesian thinking, not with foreign thinking. Like suppose CNN comes into Indonesia, and then what do we see every five minutes? The repeat of the situation is shown. Okay, and what we feel like we experienced in Indonesia in 1997-1998. Okay, the same news was broadcasted 24 hours and we thought, the world thought that Indonesia is the worst criminal place. Okay, so I support this kind of thinking that uh, certain businesses should remain with the Indonesian thinking. Like in my business, in our business of movie making, I can bring in the director and give him the credit. I can bring in the cameraman, I can give him the credit on the screen, but I will never bring a, a script writer from India and give him the, the credit. Because there, I will be blamed that I am bringing foreign thoughts to my country. Whereas this is a developing country, I have to make them strong in the way the Indonesian feel. Any success has to come from the local market. Japan will never produce anything which has no market locally. Okay. Outside market is an additional asset for us. It is an additional benefit. I will produce more 90% for Indonesian public, then I will go overseas like I am doing now. Now I am I'm self-supported. We produce 85% of the local product which is seen on the television and we have more successful Indonesian movies in Indonesia and the region than American movies. Yes, uh, my movie today is running, which is bringing better results than Titanic. Okay. Today, it's there. Maybe I have to wait for longer time to bring the successes, but I don't lose hope. I do what I can do for my country and for the region and for the world. But Mr. Chairman, um, but I think uh, if we look at the example of the Jews, the Jews have been scattered all over the world, but yet they are so united in spirit, they are so united by their belonging to their community. Uh, Indians can be, can be like that. I mean, there are, from what we are, we are hearing, there are Indians in countries where you know there's no level playing field, uh, but, but we we should think out of the tank. We should we should not let ourselves move by the forces of the world. We should move the, those forces. There's nothing re restraining you from getting an exit plan and from uh, you know developing ties using these platforms like like today and developing ties with people from America, from Mauritius, from from all the all, all places where there are Indians like you and creating new business opportunities for yourself and, and, and therefore get out of the of of the environment where you are suffering from a lack of playing field. I think there are organizations uh, which group Indians businessmen together where the aim is not to do philanthropic the aim is not to do charity but the aim is to create wealth. Thai is one example. This is an example of global Indian business summit. I think you should all exchange business cards and if you're truly entrepreneur, if you really make, want to make money, well, I mean, you know, we all look alike and we will, we will help each other. Uh, that's where we are here for, to, make, to, to, to create cross-border business. All right?
Okay. Um, sorry. Um, just I'd like to I'd like to perhaps uh, to all the people here uh, share one thing. Australia is an incredible country, which has been, which is one of actually the richest countries in the world, and the population of Australia is only 20 million people. Um, and if you look at the living standards of Australia, they are among the best in the world. And again, if you look inside Australia, it has had a very checkered history of all kinds of uh, restrictions and different things. White Australia existed in 1972, when they lifted the policy more for economic reasons than for uh, moral reasons. But in the same time, if you look to the Australian who's who of uh, success stories, almost entirely, about eight, I think the survey said 82% of the um, wealth created by entrepreneurial uh, is actually from uh, people who were born outside Australia. And the mixture is quite extraordinary. Uh, one of the richest men there is a man called Frank Lowy, who runs the Westfield organization came from Poland. Uh, there's been people who have come from every corner of the world. Uh, a close friend of mine who uh, was probably about uh, 30 before you could just land in Australia. Um, he's an African. Uh, he's actually from Zambia. Uh, he's got about a quarter Indian blood in uh, But the thing with that is that the key with all of this is that the guys have taken on all of the herbs and going back to study uh, there. All the hurdles that they've ever faced, uh, Mr. Lowy didn't know how to speak English when he started there. And they've overcome extraordinary obstacles to do what they have got to do. And that's kind of the story that we have to face. Uh, Mr. Ram, same story. It's about facing obstacles and overcoming them. Ganesh, first, and then I am. To answer the chairman's question, uh, one of the B states are the positive towards alliances. I must say yes. If you take Qatar or largely the GCC countries, the two main resources, one is the natural resource of oil and gas and energy. Even in these sectors, the state of Qatar is welcoming alliances and already there are companies like ExxonMobil, Total, who are part of the development. Musk, oil is one, and very recently ONGC has been the first company from India to get a concession to develop a specific 20,000 square feet. So I think this is very positive. In terms of non-state owned reserves, which is the private sector, I think even today 95% of the products are imported into Qatar. You can take soap, even small soaps or notebooks. If you take everything is imported. Milk is also imported, that is just a small dairy. Cement is imported, that's the cement plant. So I think the state also brings about they want to encourage SMEs. They want to increase technology coming into these places because they want to develop their local entrepreneurs, the Qatari entrepreneurs. So the Ministry of Energy and Industry publishes at least 25 feasibility reports every year for people to come and invest. It's open to, for anybody to invest, Indians, Singaporeans, people from Malaysia, anywhere in the world. And these are all global <coughs> investors. And more and more people are coming in. In the neighboring Dubai and Jebel Ali, it's 100% ownership. Anybody can open a company with just 200,000 dinars, which is less than $35,000. You can open your own company, start exporting, and be a master of your own trade. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chairman. Now, just one, uh, since I got a little to speak on that podium, and uh, you know, I'm seeing sitting from this side now a lot of folks uh, who have come from Malaysia. You know, and I want to applaud those people who have taken the time and in such large numbers to come you know, from uh, Malaysia to Singapore and the Singaporeans are really being helpful and to create this kind of entrepreneurship. So to address that point here is entrepreneurship is not easy. It's a very risk-taking proposition. And do not expect things to happen miraculously. Our company, WorldLink, is excess of $30 million. It didn't happen overnight. It took a lot of time, took a lot of trouble, a lot of risks, a lot of risk leading the family. So if any of you who are ready to take that risk and come into unknown land, you know, that's what you need to think about. And that's what entrepreneurship is completely about, is taking risks. You have an expertise. Everybody has expertise in their own line of field. What you do is you take that and add risk in it. It sounds Weird. It sounds really crazy to put risk in 
why would I put risk? I have a nice job, okay, in Malaysia or in Singapore. I have a highly paying job, hundred thousand dollars. Why would I put that into a jeopardy and go out? If you want to create substantial value, you want to create something very, very huge, then you should be able to take that risk and do it. Students who want to come abroad, that's the foundation. Students can come abroad, uh, work there, and then open the business. The US government, again, is not, it's an iconic place for uh, the liberty and the freedom and the value it stands for. Okay, time for another question or a brief comment. Yes, please go back. Actually, I'd like to just add on what Dr. Silmati said about Actually, I wrote a book in Tamil on motivation. And in the book, I actually covered a chapter on the Malaysians, in Indi the Indians in Malaysia. Actually, the scenario is very, very different from other countries. Malaysia, Indians were brought in predominantly three. Tamils were written as laborers in their state. The Malayalis were brought in to be supervised level. The, 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 the some Ceylonese Tamils were brought in also on spoils level. So the British always wanted to rule, divide and rule. And they achieved it and it just carried on. But if you talk about other parts of the world, many of them went as entrepreneurs, as businessmen looking for opportunities. Malaysia people didn't come and that mentality in Malaysia has not changed. We still live in that kind of mentality as laborers. There's 80, 90% of them still live like that. When my father, when my great grandfather came, uh, grandfather came to Malaysia, he also came as a laborer. But when he came, he always wanted to be an entrepreneur, and he started a business and he flourished. And my father did a business, and things changed for them. But so one generation has to change for the next generation to change. You know, you want to come up. And, and in, in Malaysia, this does not exist. Many people, but people want to change. They must first decide to change themselves. So this is something might be this is an opportunity for Malaysians who are here. To go and see whether talk to their friends, to go and look abroad. India, there's a lot of opportunity, and everywhere there's opportunity. But you must get yourself to the right out. No use talking to everybody and telling you're not doing well, you're only owning one person there. No use, unless you want to change yourself. And as I said, the, the scenario in the most of the world, well, Indian, is different. They all went in, look for opportunity, they, they were going for business opportunity. It's different from going for a job opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. where we both are struggling to, to make the film industry known in our region. How much curiosity I have created in my fellow Singaporeans who practically have no film industry. Okay, we speak almost the same language. You speak Bahasa. In Indonesia, there are a million of Chinese who speak Mandarin and Cantonese. How we could do things together? Has anybody been created anxiety in yourself that we can work together, we can sit down together, we can establish relationship together? Because with neighboring countries not joining hands, we are not going to reach anywhere. Please, if anybody has that, I'm available to uh, give this uh, answer. You know, for how many Indonesian patients come here and know Mr. Nayak? Plenty. Maybe thousands. <clears throat> this is what you have sold to Indonesia. I want to sell you my Indonesian expertise to you all. We produce about 75 movies a year and those movies has to be sold in the region. I'm waiting for the answer to that. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Uh, please go ahead. 
We just got five minutes extension from uh, Dinesh. That's excellent. <laughs> I want to answer Mr. Ram Punjabi. I'm from Malaysia. My name is Suba. Ever since I heard all your gentlemen speaking up there, it's been ringing in my head how to do business with each one of y'all. And I think everyone here has got the same thought in mind. Maybe someone will be shy to talk. But if we could find a way to contact each and every one of y'all, I am sure I will be contacting every one of y'all. Because, you see, we all want to do business. That's why we are here. You want to network? You guys have all gone out there, succeeded, and now when we talk about entrepreneurship, some of us are afraid. But we have you all. You all have succeeded. You guys will be able to show us how to go about it. We can communicate. And then we can, we can grow further, you see. So can we all be able to get your contact numbers, email addresses, whatnot, so we are able to keep in touch? That, that should be the easiest thing to do. <laughs> I definitely want to get in touch with all of you all. Because I'm sure the organizers here in Malaysia, I'm like yellow pages, sure. sometimes people ask me if any business opportunity. This, that, you know, I'm like yellow pages, so now I got, I tell seven, you, I got seven, seven internationally renowned people to contact. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Very last question. Very last question. As we know, we are in the Indian Business Summit, and I heard like oh, people inviting all of them to invest in the residential country. I really respect the thing that they are inviting people to invest in their own countries. But I didn't hear anyone like of you all successful Indian people going trying to go back to India and invest there. Maybe Asian class or from Australia. I didn't hear really that from anyone else. <laughs> I know it is a next session investment opportunity in India, but any of uh, the people here will be busy. Interesting conversation. Um, to many people who are coming out of the industry today, it's been very interesting. The government actually talking in terms of some transition of doing some investment, setting up operations in Punjab, and training people who are coming out of the industry. Okay, uh, I just been reminded uh, by Dinesh that is also the very core of the subject for the next session. So we'll make it very brief. Just a quick response. Sure. I'd like to answer that. As far as we are concerned, we have the cake and we're eating it too. <laughs> because we've got business in India which is growing at 25%. Yeah. We are into pharmaceutical packaging. We are into composites, we are living in the lower south of I think mean, it's a question of weighing the opportunity in each territory. So we bring both. So that's the reason we didn't talk exactly. about it. Exactly, I just want you to know whether there's some restriction barriers from India that are restricting you outside. No, we are growing, no, absolutely. We are growing in both the markets as much as we want to grow. So I think there's no restriction. So whatever we generate in India, we plow back in India. Whatever we generate in Qatar, we plow back in Qatar. That's the plus side. Both economies are growing. So we've got like to be the, the, the benefits more. of what we uh, That's why I said I, we have to take a meeting it. We would love to share with you. Sure. Oh, why not? I'll get to India. Yeah, as far as multivision is concerned, we have multivision in India private limited. We are into distribution. Now we will be producing our second movie here. I was talking to um, uh, His Excellency, the uh, Chief Minister of Gujarat, and asking them if I could be part of the uh, cineplexes in India, and he has promised me to come and see him, and he would give me uh, some good location. So yes, it is a bilateral, and uh, we would like to invest in Malaysia, as you know that I am already involved with Astro there, and then of course Singapore, and then the other countries. I appreciate the question very much, but we were told that we were ambassadors of goodwill from our own country. <laughs> so we have to promote the Philippines. As a matter of fact, that I have an establishment in India since 1995, 
and we have a lot of investments in India and the real estate sector in Maharashtra. So for your kind information, everybody here is always investing in India, especially with the share market. God bless it. So the last but not the least, what's your name, sir? Alok. Alok. So Alok, that was a very important part of my uh, power presentation with lights. You didn't see that? <laughs> <laughs> where was it last? Uh, Mr. Dinesh, where was that last? It was last uh, in the PowerPoint presentation. However, you look. Uh, we do have a, a very large initiative uh, in India. Of course, we have an offices in Gurgaon, and we're looking to expand in uh, various parts. Bangalore is a very strategic place for software development, and so is Pune and Bombay. So to answer your question, I think all of us, uh, especially, you know, have looked back and uh, seen a tremendous value in uh, what we have, where we have came from. So greatly appreciate your question. Thank you. Thank you. That was the yeah. Okay, thank you a lot. Yeah. Well, I'm afraid that we really have to wrap up, uh, even with the extension, uh, you know, we are uh, eating into the uh, lunchtime arrangement. So on behalf of all of you, uh, I want to thank what has turned out to be an extremely interesting and, uh, you know, the variety of experiences is not something we normally hear in extended conferences. And also, for the self-initiated that most of them have taken, which I think is uh, really very inspiring, so once again, on all of behalf, uh, let's show our appreciation to the seven speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen, for this very enlightening and thought-provoking session. We real realize that to keep the mind working, one has to keep the body in shape. And therefore, we'll all break for a networking uh, session of lunch. Uh, we will assemble here ourselves in, this, in these rooms precisely at 2 p.m. That is 1,400 hours, as the Air Force would say. So let us decide to be here by 1,400 hours, where we have very interesting people to listen to, including the Honorable Chief Minister of Gujarat, Mr. Narendra Modi, and many other dynamic senior officials and we have some very special dignitaries. Kindly remember, 2 p.m. And we bring for a lovely, lovely session. Thank you very much for